So if we are continuing from where we left off, your daughter? No? Oh, okay. okay. So if we continue from where we left off last class, our last class was based on the concept of being able to see everything as a field of unchanging good without exception. And we ended with that chant from the Prashna Upanishad about Bhadram Parnebi with my ears. Let me hear only the good and the auspicious. With my eyes, let me see only the good and the auspicious. But where, how does that happen? Did any of you try to practice last class? Did you bring it into your life in any way? Yeah, Isha, tell us. I did, but uh, so something negative happened um, at work. And um, so when I heard about it, we said we weren't going to get an increment which um, we were expecting. So when um, my colleague told me that and I heard it and I um, felt upset or whatever, uh, after that, I put the phone down and I tried to think that this is also Bhadram, let me, let me um, you know, let it, it has fallen on my ears, I can't control what falls on my ears, but I can control how I interpret it. So, I did that own Bhadram breathing and it didn't completely, um, you 
know, take away the disappointment or anything, but it definitely had an impact. Okay, lovely. So there was one person who went in for a surgery last week and she would just been part of this class and she said she entered the OT constantly inhaling with home and exhaling with Bhadram and just trying to see the good in the whole atmosphere there and she said I was surprisingly not troubled or not worried and uh, she had to do an MRI before that and we know that MRIs are overwhelming for some people in terms of just going through the machine and whatever. And she said she was so much with this Om Bhadram that she just thought, okay, mother, this is one more experience you're taking me through. It's going to be fine. And uh, there's another story I want to share with you. It's from Radhanath Swami's book, the journey home. Radhanath Swami heads the ISKCON in Mumbai and he's actually an American who had such an urge to be in India that he went through all sorts of experiences um, without really having the finances and made it to India. And uh, this is a st on his way to India, he was in Afghanistan for a while. And he, there's the one story in his book about once he was given hospitality by this Afghani gentleman and suddenly the gentleman started howling and he thought, what happened? Has this man who was so good to me till now suddenly, you know, something has happened to him. And then he saw him taking out a rope and pulling a mongoose up. And it was a ritual with this man that every day in the evening he would make these howling sounds and he had this kind of pet mongoose who would come and he would pull the mongoose up. And Radhanath Swami had long hair those days. So before he knew it, the mongoose climbed into his long hair thinking it's a nest and sat on top. And before he knew it, the mongoose fell asleep. So Radhanath Swami is telling his host that, well, please do something about it. So the host said, out of question to do anything, mongooses are considered very sacred here and we cannot disturb a sleeping mongoose. You will have to hold it there till the mongoose wakes up because uh, anyway, mongooses are very ferocious and if you irritate him, he might just bite into your scalp and shatter it to smith smithereens. So Radhanath Swami was sitting with the mongoose, heavy mongoose. His neck was really hurting. The mongoose had brought all kind of insects which he could feel biting into his head. And uh, he sat for hours after a while. His host said that, okay, now it's time for me to sleep. But you just sit and in the morning when the mongoose goes, you get up and go. So Radhan, I mean, this is bizarre, but to think he actually went through it. So he was just sitting and his neck went numb with pain and he was being bitten, but he dare not lift his hand because of the mongoose wakes up and whatever. And he was just really thinking what kind of, for a moment, feeling helpless and whatever. And then suddenly the realm of Bhadram opened out in him. He suddenly said, Oh God, you've come in the form of a mongoose to teach me patience and forbearance. So he just said, after the first two, three hours of struggle, he just sat with so much gratitude that this experience also, how much patience it's treating me. And think about it, if you go through something like that, you feel confident you can go through anything else in life, right? So he said next few hours he spent in total gratitude and they flew past and then at daybreak the mongoose woke up, climbed down and left and of course his neck was totally gone but that's the whole point. He, he had a choice at, as Isha said to spend the whole night fretting and fuming about why has this happened to me and so wrong? Of the, He could have spent the whole night in blaming or he could have taken it as grace. And that is what mother says that if you take 
everything that comes to you as grace, you will see that it is indeed grace. What happens to you is what happens to you, but it's you who make it into a curse or a blessing. But beyond what your mind makes of it, the Vedas tell us that if everything is the body of the God, of God, then in the body of the God there is only Kalyan, there is only good, there is only Shubh. But if we see world and life as divorced from God, then we start calling it good and bad. What's pleasing to our ego is good, what's displeasing to our ego is bad. But if we just see everything as this is God, in every occurrence, in every person, and see Radhanath Swami had the wisdom to say, Oh God, you've come in the form of, the, of a mongoose to teach me patience and forbearance. And that gratitude helped him to go through the whole ordeal in such a beautiful way. So, or that lady who went into the operation theatre or the MRI, the same thing could be torture. I know people who've gone into the MRI machine and just not been able to do it because it's so overwhelming. But if you go into anything with this kind of gratitude and just that belief that everything is happening in the body of God and everything is only going to take me to a good place, then you enter the field of Bhadram. Okay? Yes, so beautifully said, no, that you cannot ever attack anyone without attacking Brahma. Brahma is the God essence, no, Vedanta talks about the God essence in everything as Brahma. So you can never ever attack anyone without attacking Brahma, isn't it? Because whoever you are attacking, somewhere you are attacking that being of God. So uh, the Buddha talks about Pratitya Samutpad or codependent origination where he says this is because that is. So he talks about the whole of existence as a metaphor as a spherical net and in each hollow of the net there's a translucent colored jewel so that the color of any one jewel is the sum total of the colors of all the other jewels in the net so every jewel is made up of all the colors of every other jewel so each of us is that jewel so anaita is made up of all non-anaita elements, right? Imagine we are part of the spherical net and y'all are just maybe 10 of you, but billions, zillions. And each one is reflecting on me, I'm reflecting on each one. So I am because everyone else is. If the color of even one jewel in the net changes, everything else in the jewel will change. So this is because that is. That's Buddha's Pratitya Samutpad. But Vedanta takes this whole concept of Pratitya Samutpad a step further. So just listen. You can open your PDF if you like. So in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, there's a canto called the Madhu Kand, the chapter on honey, and it goes on to say, wait, don't read, just listen, that for the earth, all its creatures are honey, and for its creatures, earth is honey, and both earth and the creatures are permeated by that one infinite being. So, if you read it, that's the way Upanishads are, you'll say, okay, but uh, what is the big deal? But that's because we are looking at it at a very surface level. What it's really saying is that 
everything is fully permeated by Brahma, by God and everything is constantly exchanging honey with itself. So keep this in mind as I read this bit called exchanging honey. As explored in the Buddha's Pratitya Samutpad, this is because that is. This and that are part of the seamless honey of the divine presence. Any exchange between this and that is an exchange of the honey of this presence with itself. So I may feel I'm having an exchange with Isha or Isha is having an exchange with Anaita. But it's actually Brahma here having, a, having an exchange with Brahma there. So, any exchange between this and that is an exchange of honey of this presence. You can sit on the chair with itself. When the eyes of this honey, the divine presence are discovered, the honey concealed in all is seen and everything is a flow from honey to honey. So this honey is Brahma. When the eyes of honey, this divine presence which is in everyone and everything are discovered, the honey concealed in all is seen and everything is a flow from honey to honey. Do you understand? That's what the Mani, Madhukand of the Brihadaryanka Upanishad is saying. Earth is honey to its creatures and its creatures are honey to earth and there's a constant exchange of this honey with each other. So if you take it to Buddha's Pratitya Samutpad, uh, the light reflected from Nash, whatever Nash is feeling just now, it's not remaining in his brain, it's affecting me, right? It's affecting the whole universe. Whatever I'm feeling and thinking just now is affecting the whole universe. So, why is that so? Because that is also Brahma. If Brahma is all powerful and Brahma here is all powerful, every thought of Nash is a thought of Brahma, right? Every thought of Anaita is a thought of Brahma. So, if it's a thought of Brahma, it's going to affect the whole cosmos, right? So that's why we are told to be so responsible with our thoughts. We, school teaches us be responsible with your actions. But nobody tells us to be responsible with our thoughts, right? You're very angry with somebody and you think of killing the person in your mind, you'll solace yourself that, but I've only done it in my mind. But no, that thought, that violence is somewhere not only impacting the person, but impacting the whole. So, beautifully said, no, that the greatest way to change the universe is to change your consciousness. Yes? Are all thoughts equal though? Like more impactful than others. Shruti, the more conscious you are as a person, the more powerful your thought is. The more you're connected with your God essence, that's why a sage, when he says something, his words come true, right? So in the ancient times, people used to be very afraid of curses of the sages or they used to really seek blessings of the sages. Because whatever they said and thought had that much more power in the cosmos. If you are living a very superficial existence, your thoughts will not have that much power. Also the amount of intention you put behind a thought. If you not put too much intention, it's okay. But if you put a lot of intention behind thought, it has that much more effect. So, Everything is really exchanging honey with everything else. Brahma in me is constantly interacting with the Brahma in you. These are Sri Aurobindo's words, end purpose of creation. 
And what is the end of the whole matter? As if honey could taste itself and its drops together. Imagine there's honey. Can honey taste itself? No. But each of us has to be that kind of honey that can taste itself. What does it mean that I'm honey that can taste itself? I know myself as Brahma, as Brahma Swaroop, not as Anaita, but as a Swaroop of Brahma. So, as if honey could taste itself and its drops together. And then, when I know that the same self here is the self in everyone else, right? That Brahma, that self here is the same self in everyone else. So when I live with this realization, the, this honey drop is not only tasting itself, but it's tasting honey in everyone else as well. So, as if honey could taste itself and its drops together, and all its drops could taste each other, and each the whole honeycomb as itself. So should be the end with God and soul of man and the universe. Love is the keynote, joy is the music, power is the strain, knowledge is the performer, the infinite all is the composer and the audience. We know only the preliminary discords, the initial disharmonies, which are as fierce as the harmony shall be great. If we have some discord in our life, something unpleasant, Sri Aurobindo is assuring us, we know only the preliminary, the earlier discords, which are as fierce as the harmony shall be great. But we shall sh arrive surely at the fugue of divine beatitudes. So, Let's just make this real for ourselves. Let's sit up straight. And let's work with the three Mahavakyas of Vedanta. The first one, Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahma. Aham Brahmasmi. Each of these Mahabhakya have all the power of the many, many times sages of India have repeated them. So you'll feel a difference in repeating to yourself Aham Brahmasmi as compared to I am Brahma. Focusing in the heart space, just repeat three times Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahma. I am the self. And then Sarvam Brahma. Everything is Brahma. Not only I am Brahma, everything is Brahma, Sarvam Brahma. Slowly open your eyes whenever you feel like. So what was the feeling when you worked with these Mahavakyas? 
Anything, Barun? Any feeling when you worked with them? Yeah? Connecting into something, connect, creating a circuit. Uh, and something in you resonates with a truth, right? Uh, very often when you'll say these things, you might find your body tingling or goose flesh because your body is a truth detector. Even if your mind can't recognize the truth, whenever a truth is heard, the body often responds. So just to know that the same self which is in me is in everything without exception and I cannot violate or have violence towards anything without violating the self, right? If you remember that, there will be a difference in your interactions with everyone, right? Because you feel it's okay to harm another somewhere at a very surface level but I always want to protect myself from harm to myself. But if I really, really understand at my core that I can never harm anyone without harming myself, then my whole interaction with everyone else changes. Then I don't feel so threatened by anyone. Just, uh, you should try this on and off. Whenever a thought of anyone makes you feel threatened, threatened about feeling diminished because they don't think well of you. That's often a threat, no? We want to look good in people's eyes. They don't, don't think good of me, so I feel threatened or threatened because their behavior towards me is one way or the other. Or I'm threatened about something that could be a possibility in the future. So beautiful if I just say Sarvam Brahma. This too is Brahma. And in Savitri, there's a beautiful phrase to feel the familiarity of God everywhere. Uh, yeah, to feel, no, not familiarity. The word was intimacy of God everywhere. Yeah, you feel intimate with God. So that person I'm feeling threatened by, I don't feel intimate. I feel very separate from that. But the moment I say you two are God, you two are the self, there is an intimacy of God. And you don't move threatened by the universe. You move as if you are with family wherever you go. Because if everyone you see as an extension of yourself, there is a natural feeling of effortless care and giving to everyone you meet not because you've been conditioned to be a good person. There's nothing moral about it. Uh, religion will always tell you this is right, this is wrong. But spirituality is not about right and wrong. It's about truth. This is the truth of my being, that I know that you are myself. So I want the best for you the way I want the best for myself. I don't want to hurt you the way I don't want to hurt myself. And this self, which is everywhere, the Upanishad says, is the real experiencer of every experience. We think I an item experiencing, right? If Siddhi speaks to me well, Anaita is having a pleasant experience. If Siddhi speaks to me badly, Anaita is having an unpleasant experience. But Anaita is just a mental construct, right? My parents named me Anaita. They could have named me anything else. Whatever I know about Anaita is also what my thoughts tell me about Anaita. So whatever I know about Anaita is a bundle of thoughts. It's a mental construct. A, man, a mental construct has no ontological existence, existence in being. You understand that, no? I can dream a beautiful dream, but that dream has no ontological existence. It's there as a dream, but it doesn't exist. 
So my seeing myself as an Aita is a dream. It has no ontological existence. So can an illusion experience anything? Can it? It can't, no? It will interpret it, uh, but say Anaita is a movie playing in my mind, okay, and everything that's experienced will add to the storyline of that movie. But is that movie a real being that can have the experience? It's not, right? A movie can't experience anything. The one who is watching the movie can experience. So the self in me is the watcher of that movie. So the all experience is finally experienced by the self, not by the mind. I think the mind is experiencing, but finally all experience is only experienced by the self. And Krishna tells Arjun in the Gita, Oh Arjun, you are that and when he is addressing Arjun, he is addressing all humanity. You are that which no fire can burn, no water can wet, no sword can cleave. Why is he saying that? Because he is reminding Arjun, you are not the Arjun you think you are. You are the eternal self, you are Brahma. And no fire can burn Brahma, no water can wet Brahma, no sword can cleave Brahma. So if everything that is experienced, the final experiencer is the self and the self is something that is actually unconditionally unaffected by experience, if you really get this, it can bring you great relief. If I am experiencing sorrow or anxiety, that is in the realm of the movie that I think I am. But the real me is untouched by it. It cannot experience all that. Uh, think about it. Uh, the story I started with Radhanath, Radhanath Swami, the mongoose. I mean, it's quite horrifying if you think about a heavy mongoose pressing your neck down. You know, you see people carrying luggage and we say it's not good for their neck, but it, their neck shortens. Imagine six, seven hours that heavy weight on your head with all the insects and all, it's quite a horrific experience, but he comes out of it full of gratitude on his feet. Obviously, there's a part of him which was untouched by this experience, no? If he was affected by, and, and this is one experience in the world, people experience far worse things, but they come back on their feet. So, Sri Aurobindo has a very sound logic. He says that, if we didn't have this self of joy sustaining us through our pain, then we would perish with the pain. The very fact that we don't perish, it means that we are outside the pain. We are this self which is unconditional bliss, which is never affected really by what we go through. Hmm. No, what are you saying? You are in gratitude. You may understand this whole phenomena. You may even experience it. You can see that there is pain and there is that which is not pain. But the pain still arises. Or sure. The sure. Or the because Purvi, we are made up of many different parts, no? So you may have gratitude in your psychic, which influences your vital emotional being. But you may have pain in your mental, vital, you are not monolithic, you are made up of many beings. So there may be pain in a surface part of yourself and you are simultaneously feeling gratitude for, for it from within. So then, you know, we did a class on the higher nature and lower nature with both, both exist simultaneously. And the rule of yoga is to 
use the leverage of the higher nature to transform the lower nature. So don't feed the pain and the angst of the lower nature, feed the gratitude of the higher nature and keep offering the angst of the lower nature to the higher nature to be transformed. But of course we are human, we will have pain, but at least let us not call pain a bad thing. Let us, let us not be paranoid about wanting to escape pain at any cost. I'm feeling pain, it's okay. I'm not going to perish with it because there's a part of me which is not touched by it. And that part is going to see me through the pain. Let me just be present to it, learn from it whatever I have to. Because we've discussed now, pain always comes with a hidden gift. You don't have to indulge it, but you don't have to resist it either. You just have to be open to it, be present to it, see what message it has to give you, and it will go in its own season. And likewise for other things like anxiety, maybe there is something you don't even want to say. Yeah, yeah. So acknowledge it and offer it to mother and uh, maybe various ways stay in your heart for 108 breaths with the mother's presence or light, write a letter to her or just give it to her and be present to it. Don't feel it's a bad thing because then you'll start resisting it. It's not bad, it's part of my human experience. I'm going to be fully present to it. I'm going to pay attention to it. So, our total being can rise out of subjection to fact of present nature only by an identification with a greater truth and a greater nature. This is a line from Life Divine. Our total being can rise out of subjection to the fact of present nature. Our present nature, what you were talking about. We can rise out of subjection to being bound by that anxiety. Being overwhelmed by that anxiety, for instance, is subjection to the fact of present nature. We can rise out of this only by an identification with a greater truth and a greater nature. So Sri Aurobindo heard your question. See how timely it was. He answers it. So what this is saying is we've established that there's an Anaita I live with, a movie, a mental construct and a watcher of the movie, the self, right? Now, if I am identified with Anaita, I am going to be overwhelmed by whatever the nature of Anaita throws out, anxiety, resentment, excitement, whatever else. But if I shift my identity to the self, then I'm not affected by what Anaita goes through or I'm affected less by it because in a very selfish way what affects me the most is what happens to me, right? If Nash loses a watch, I won't be as affected as if I lose my watch, right? My watch. If I get fever, I'll be far more unhappy than if Shruti gets fever because fever is directly affecting me. So if I am thinking that I am this Anaita who's having anxiety, I suffer more. But if I remind myself that I am not this Anaita, I am the watcher of this Anaita, I am the self which is totally unaffected by the movie that Anaita is going through, you can come and do pranam. So, if that is the case, then I won't be so affected at all by whatever happens. So how do I shift this identity? Sri Aurobindo is saying that the way out of being subjected to the lower nature is to shift identity from the surface self to the deeper self. 
uh, how do I do this? When I'm suffering, I'm ob obviously very identified with the surface self. So how do I shift identity? How do you realize that? It's multiple techniques. We keep doing breath work or whether it's chanting mantra or brahma technique. That recognition is to, because we are so recognized in the moment with that moment. Like in that moment if I'm anxious, if I recognize it. My mind recognizes the fact that I am in that anxiety. Nash is anxious. That is the thought in my mind. I am anxious. The distance can only come if I can tell myself no. Nash is feeling the anxiety, but Nash is not anxious. Yes. Nash isn't anxiety itself. We embody the anxiety. Strangely. And the Nash who is feeling the anxiety, I am outside that Nash. Yeah. You know, yeah? it's like uh, the thing, you know, when you say I am sad, it's almost like I identified with sad. I am feeling sad. The more you use that word feeling it, the distance, the more you can distance from it, that's when you can uh, distinguish that, oh, this is just a feeling. Yes, which will come and go. If it was me, it should stay forever, right? Because I have a sense that what I am is eternal. But everything that comes and go is not really me, not wholly me. It comes on the surface, it passes. Yes? Huh. That's a very good question, Varun. Varun has asked, why do we sometimes like to indulge? Because we are comfortable with it. Because it's our identity. Like once I was working with a teenager who always had a lot of sadness. And when we were working for her to get out of the sadness, she said, you know, I felt very uncomfortable getting rid of the sadness because I know that I am a sad, suppose her name was Meena, that I am a sad Meena. But if I drop the sadness, then who is Meena? Safety of, Safety of comfort zone. I typecast myself into a mold and then even if it's painful, I am comfortable in that. Till I realize that it's not serving me. And then I may want to break out of it. See, anything familiar we want to hold on to. Even if that familiar thing is dark, at least it's familiar. I'm comfortable with it. But at some point, you start getting so uncomfortable with it that you're willing to make the leap of faith and let go of the familiarity. Yeah? So, I'll read this sentence from Life Divine again. Our total being can rise out of subjection to the fact of present nature only by an identification with a greater truth and a greater nature. I'll shut your eyes and feel this inside you. Our total being can rise out of subjection to fact of present nature. Ask yourself. What is the fact of my present nature just now? What am I feeling? Is there sadness? Is there anxiety? Is there fear? Is there neutrality? I can rise out of these feelings and subjection to them by an identification with a greater truth and a greater nature. So whatever I'm feeling just now, let me take deep breaths. Maybe a mantra will help. Aham on the inhalation, Brahmasmi on the exhalation. The real experiencer of all these emotions is the self. And the self is unconditional self-existent joy. The surface sorrow cannot touch the joy of this self. So deep inside, I am unchanging joy who is momentarily wearing this mask of pain 
but the wearer of that mask of pain is still all joy. Just with this thought, breathe with aham on the inhalation, brahmasmi on the exhalation. And see if through that smile in your heart, you can simply witness the fluctuating mind states, emotional states, and somewhere know that you are outside them. You are that which no fire of anger can burn, no sword of hurt and sorrow can cleave. No water of fear can wet. You are outside all these. And this is your freedom. So our total being can rise out of subjection to fact of present nature only by identification with a greater truth and a greater nature. We go on with the PDF. When I am identified with Anaita, and here use your own name. I've used my name. Use your own name. Anaita is always incomplete and seeks completion by fulfilling desires. Clear? Whenever I'm identified with my ego sense, my desire self, that desire self is always incomplete. And because it's incomplete, it feels, if I fulfill this desire, I'll be happy. If I shop that much online, I'll be happy. If I go out, I'll be happy. If that one calls me, I'll be happy. So by fulfilling desires, I'll be happy. Anaita is always incomplete and seeks completion by fulfilling desires. This is like trying to quench thirst with salt water. Do you get that? When you try to complete yourself through fulfilling desires, it's like trying to quench your thirst with salt water. What happens when you drink salt water? You get more thirsty. The more I shop online, more, more, more. The more I party, more, more, more. Till I reach exhaustion, but I'm still not complete. This is like trying to quench thirst with salt water. When I'm identified with the self, S capital, I am complete, Purnam. Hence, there is no desire. I desire when my identity with the self is weak. When I'm more identified with the surface anaita and my identity with the self is weak, then I start desiring because if any of you need a backrest, you can come here. You can take a cushion from there and come here against the wall. Go ahead. You can come here. So, uh, there is the surface self and there is the deeper self. The more I am identified with the surface self, the more incomplete I am. And Vedanta says it very beautifully that because deep down I am that fountain of bliss, I am that self who is all bliss, I cannot settle down for an experience of blisslessness. I'm constantly reaching out for that bliss because deep down I know that's my truth. But in completing desires, I'm, re I'm misdirecting that original impulse to go back home to joy. I'm thinking that by fulfilling desires, I'll be complete. And the more identified I am with my surface self, the more I'll keep desiring and the more I'll keep drinking salt water and remaining thirsty. But when I'm identified with the self, I am complete. Hence, there's no desire. I desire when my identity with the self is weak. When I'm more identified with the surface me, then my identity with the surface me is strong and my identity with the deeper self is weak. Then I keep desiring. 
when my identity with the self is stronger, there is less desire. Have you noticed that? You know, sometimes we go more to in identity with the deeper self without even knowing it. For example, when you're in nature, you're with a beautiful sunset. Without even knowing it, you're connecting with something deeper in you. And that time, there's just contentment. You don't need that extra online shopping or that party or that phone call to feel complete. Because the more you're identified with your deeper self, the less desires you have. The more you're on your surface self, the more desires you'll have. I desire when my identity with the self is weak. When my identity with self is stronger, there is less desire. When my identity with the self is total, there is no desire. So see, identity with the self weak, lots of desire. Identity with the self stronger, lesser desire. Identity with the self total, no desire. Because then there is purnam, there is completeness. Uh, that's what the Vedic rishis tell us is a state of nitya trip. They promise us that what you are in your depths is not this surface lacking self. You are something that's nitya tript, eternally quenched, and nitya shud, eternally pure. Because whatever impurities you experience on your surface, they cannot go down to your deeper self. So, when my identity with the self is total, there is no desire. Then there is wholeness in the being. Then there is no incompletion. Therefore, no yearning for completion. Therefore, no desire. So see the logic in this. When I am not aware of my ocean self, my deeper self, I am identified with the surface me. That surface me is incomplete. And because I know that's not my truth, I'm grasping to go home to my truth of bliss. But that desire for the original bliss gets misdirected into fulfilling desires. But the closer I come to my deeper self, the more complete I feel, the less thirsty I am, the less desires there are. And when I'm fully with my deeper self, there's no desire because I'm already complete. I am that which nothing in life can add to, nothing in life can subtract from. So I have no desire to push anything away or pull anything towards me. I'm already complete. I'm already what Krishna tells Arjun in the Gita. He tells, oh Krishna, you are my Purnasya Purna. You are the wholeness of my wholeness. And we remember, no, that whatever Krishna tells Arjun in the Gita is his address to humanity all through ages. Yes? You were saying something. No, nobody is telling you to totally not have desires. That is for an enlightened sage who has got complete identity with himself then he'll have no desires. He just sits in total completion. But where you are, you will have desires, but explore your relationship with desires. Nothing wrong with desires. But explore whether they are really satisfying you or every time we are running after desire, it's like quenching your thirst with salt water. The more you drink it, the more you need, the more you it's need. It's almost like if you have a desire for something, you want it, but can you let it go after it's passed? So you keep wanting it again and again. Yes. Many a time, the repetitive cycle is the problem. Yes. On that one desire, one. Why is there a repetitive cycle, Nash? Because it's quenching your thirst with that salt water. Is there. Babu, salt water, if you'll drink, you'll yeah. want to drink more, more and more, more because it's not quenching your thirst. So if a desire comes and you are fulfilled with it, then maybe it's not problematic for you because you want the repetitive uh, nature of it. That's what's dangerous. Yes. If you like it the first time, you want to try it again. 
because it's given you a momentary satisfaction which doesn't really last because for a that split second of a desire fulfilled you feel complete but it's a fake sense so you'll feel incomplete again so just explore your relationship see how you feel before fulfilling a desire after and learn from it and mother said something very beautiful i tell you the simple things mother says they have all the depth of vedanta and all she said there's infinitely greater joy in letting go of a desire than fulfilling it think about it why did she say that there's much more joy in letting go of a desire than fulfilling it why is that so because see one thing is to artificially let go of a desire we are not talking about that i really want that shoe online but i have promised myself no more online shopping so i won't buy that shoe but i am hankering for it every time i think of it i'm feeling unhappy that's not letting go of the desire that no if you can't let go of it then fulfill it there's no point in killing yourself you know a squash desire is much more disastrous than a fulfilled desire so then fulfill it but fulfill it consciously if you fulfill a desire consciously you'll break the cycle of rip what does it mean consciously you go, you say i'm making an experiment i'm going to buy that shoe but i'm aware of what i'm feeling while shopping i'm aware of what i feel when the shoe comes i'm aware of what i'll feel when i wear it so if you are really conscious of it you will see that yeah it was really a waste of money i have 10 pairs of shoes i got that one more pair i wore it once then i'm not even thinking about it so money is also mother it's lakshmi i'm only a guardian of it let me be a wise guardian of it let me not spend it in stupid ways what if you can't okay it's not a shoe it's a desire to have the company of a person example and that person doesn't want your company you can't fulfill the desire example we all face that not just you so then what do you do so wait i'll answer that question but first let me not break the thread mother says there's much more joy in releasing a desire than fulfilling it why does she say that because i have that desire to shop let me work with this example i'll come to your example later to buy that shoe online before i click on amazon i'm sitting with that desire and i'm feeling the desire and i am really with it i know that i'm desiring it because i'm identified with my surface self we've done that right but if i shift my identity to the deeper self and i know that in my deeper self i'm so full that the shoe can't add anything to me so when i actually let go of that desire for the shoe i can't let go of it by stepping into my deeper self and that one step into the deeper self is what brings me joy if the shoe will bring me this much joy a taste of my deeper self will bring me that much joy so that's why mother says that there's infinitely more joy in releasing a desire genuinely authentically releasing it than in fulfilling it so the desire imprisons you also you are imprisoned in that desire because then you the moment you are freed from it there's like a lightness but when you're caught in that desire and you're caught again and you're caught again it's like to feel wrapped more and more in you. Yes. And yes. You say cutting that wrapping around you and feel ah more love. Yes. So to your question suppose that I have a desire which I would move heaven and earth to fulfill because I'm overwhelmed by it but the universe is not allowing it to be fulfilled that can also happen right? So then instead of being so cut up and overwhelmed by it sit with it remember your desiring because you are identified with your surface self that line from life divine 
put it up somewhere in your room. It's such a beautiful priceless line. Our total being can rise out of subjection to the fact of present nature. My present nature is I'm hungering to fulfill this desire which the universe is not granting me. For instance, our total being can rise out of subjection to the fact of present nature only by an identification with a greater truth and a greater nature. So sit with this mantra, Aham Brahmasmi. I am not this surface Anaita which is desiring it and hurting from the desire not being fulfilled. I am the deeper self which is Krishna's Purnasya Purna, the wholeness of his wholeness. This object of desire cannot complete me, although I have the illusion that it will complete me. I am already complete. This can't add to me, this can't subtract from me. I know if you are very overwhelmed by your need for that thing, you won't believe these lines very much. But keep repeating them because they are the truth of your deepest. And the more you articulate in your being, something from within will arise and breathe belief into it. Yeah? So when desire comes, I can shift identity from the ego self to the eternal self. Then there is no desire, only quenched fullness. Nitya Trip. Again words from Life Divine. He would feel the presence of a person who is identified with the self would feel the presence of the divine in every center of his consciousness, in every vibration of his life force, in every cell of his body. The Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, so beautifully there's a line, Naina, Naina is no Kinchan, Kincha is a particle, Anavritam, An Avritam is enveloped by, Anavritam is not enveloped by. So, Naina, Kinchan, Anavritam, there is not a particle in existence which is not enveloped by this self, by this Brahma. Naina, Kinchan, Asamvritam. Samvritam is penetrated. There is not a particle in existence which is not penetrated by this self. We know it intellectually. But a sage knows this as an experience, that there is in every vibration of his life force, in every cell of his body, in all the workings of his force of nature, he would be aware of the workings of the Supreme World Mother, the Supernature. He would see his natural being as the becoming and manifestation of the power of the world mother. In this consciousness, he would live and act in an entire transcendent freedom, a complete joy of the spirit, an entire identity with the cosmic self and a spontaneous sympathy with all in the universe. Why does he say a spontaneous sympathy with all in the universe? Yeah, if everything is myself, I'm constantly in sympathy with everything. Yes, you'll want to nurse it, right? Uh, whereas if I see a beggar on the street, his foot bleeding, I'll turn my face away. But a being like that sees himself in the beggar and he wants to serve. It's a beautiful line, no, in Savitri. Mm. He who hunts and seizes me, my captive becomes. Learn this from your heart throbs, forever love, O beautiful slave of God. So he who hunts and seizes me, the one who hunts God and seizes God, becomes a slave of God. This learn from your heart beats forever love, O beautiful slave of God. And uh, 
Many people in Pondicherry say that, that we went to Pondi with all ideas of our own. But once we met mother and somehow offered ourselves to her, we don't know how, she became totally our empress and we became totally her slave. Surendranath Johar in his book actually writes in jest, had I known this earlier, I would have thought twice. Of course, he doesn't mean it, but he says, I came to her with these plans and that plan, I'll do this, I'll do that. But finally, nothing. I just became her slave. I could only do what she bid me to do. So he who hunts and seizes me, my captive becomes. This is God speaking. So, all beings would be to him his own self. So, uh, again in Savitri, there's that beautiful line, Thou shall be helplessly attracted to all. This is God telling Savitri, Thou shalt be helplessly attracted to all. You won't be able to help yourself. You'll just be attracted to all and you'll want to serve me and everyone. All beings would be to him his own selves. All ways and powers of consciousness would be felt as the ways and powers of his own universality. All ways and powers of consciousness would be felt as ways and powers of his own universality. At first sight, this insistence on a radical change of nature, what change of nature? from identity with the surface self to identity with the deeper self <coughs> might seem to put off all the hope of humanity to a distant evolutionary future for the transcendence of our normal human nature, a transcendence of our mental, vital and physical being has the appearance of an endeavor too high and difficult and at present for man, he is impossible. Even if it were so, it would still remain the sole possibility of transmutation of life. Come a few lines down, one, two, three, four, five, six, sixth line from the bottom. What is necessary is that there should be a turn in humanity felt by some or many towards the vision of this change. Some segment of humanity should feel a need to grow into this change. A feeling of its imperative need, the sense of its possibility, the will to make it possible in themselves and to find the way. The trend is not absent and it must increase with the tension of the crisis in the human world destiny. The need of an escape or a solution, Savitri again has that gem, life is a paradox. I am sometimes as a human being full of pain but I want to be happy, right? That's the paradox. Life is a paradox with God for key. So when we discover this God self in us and we have to be willing to move heaven and earth to discover it and that's what the crisis of the world is pointing to. So that's what Sri Aurobindo is saying. The trend is not absent. The trend to seek this God self is not absent and it must increase with the tension of the crisis in the human world destiny. The need of an escape or a solution, the feeling that there is no other solution than the spiritual cannot but grow. We come to see that there is no solution to my problems but a spiritual awakening because that is finally the only solution to my unhappiness. Everything else is quenching thirst with salt water. Rumi says it so beautifully, you know, lifetime after lifetime. I drank at outer founts and remained thirsty. Now I drink from within and at last my thirst is quenched. The trend is not absent and it must increase with the tension of the crisis in the human world destiny. 
the need of an escape or a solution, the feeling that there is no other solution than the spiritual cannot but grow and become more imperative under the urgency of critical circumstance. To that call in the being, there must always be some answer in the divine reality and in nature. If we really have this call, the divine will surely answer. Sri Aurobindo's symbol, upward rising triangle, our call. Descent, the divine's answer. Where the two meet, the lotus of perfection blooms. So if we really have this call in us, We'll see how the universe, divine, whatever we call it, is bound to answer. People will come to us, we'll find books, we'll find some guidance or the other which will lead us on in the way. But we must have this call. Mother says that people who have no aspiration and no call to grow are among the living dead. We come alive when we have an aspiration, when we really want to know, we want to grow, we want to discover. So coming back to the topic of desire, one way out of desire is to identify more and more with our deeper self. But sometimes we are not able to, right? Sometimes our identity with the surface self is so strong that we can't identify with anything else. So as my yoga teacher beautifully said, Remove a thorn with a thorn. Uh, if you have a thorn in your skin, it won't come out when you pull it. No, you take another thorn and you dig into your skin to remove that first thorn, isn't it? So if desire is the thorn, you use another desire to remove it. Yeah? Yeah? So if desire is the greatest weakness of your mind, you can make it your greatest strength. How? We did this years ago by always reminding yourself, whatever I desire, I want the mother more. Or I want silence more. Or I want the beautiful feeling I feel when I'm with my God self more. So whatever I'm desiring to remind myself, yeah, I want this. But deep inside, I want something else more. And to make your that desire so big that you remove a thorn with a thorn. Yeah? So, Sri Aurobindo beautifully says, he describes in this passage of Savitri, that's our last passage, the evolution of desire. He says, First, desire is for normal human things, an animal's desire. Then the same desire grows to the desire for God. And that's how we make our greatest weakness. Nash, while you were away, we were, we were saying that sometimes this desire can be the greatest weakness of the human mind, but we can make it our greatest strength. By removing the thorn of desire with the thorn of a greater desire. By reminding yourself that whatever I desire, I want the mother more. And to feed that desire. Yeah, a distorted, a misdirected yeah. aspiration. So turning it back to its native state. Yes. Yes, yes, so this passage, a mystic slow transfiguration works. All our earth starts from mud and ends in sky, geographically also, no? We start from mud and as you rise it ends in sky, that's the earth, it's a metaphor. And love was once an animal's desire, yeah? Even in us, love can be in the form of lust, an animal desire. It's still love, but a distorted form of love. Then a sweet madness in a rapturous heart. So our love for the beloved grows from lust to something more emotional. I get an emotional connect. 
an ardent comradeship in a happy mind, then that emotional passion becomes a friendship. So these are the stages of evolution, even in a partner, right? It may start with physical attraction, lust, then it can evolve to a feeling of great emotional passion, then it can mutate to friendship. So, all our earth starts from mud and ends in the sky, from the mud of lust to the sky of more sublimated things. And love was once an animal's desire, then a sweet madness in the rapturous heart, an ardent comradeship in the happy mind, becomes a wide spiritual yearning space. So it can become friendship for another being and then that is also not enough. Finally, love becomes a yearning for something beyond. We say, no, the world is not enough. After a point, whatever the partner can give me also is not enough. I want something more. So, an ardent comradeship in the happy mind becomes a wide spiritual yearning space. A lonely soul passions for the alone. So, there's a difference between loneliness and aloneness. Loneliness is when I want company. But the last chapter of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras is called Kevalya Pad. What is Kevalya? Aloneness, Keval, onlyness. So when I believe that I only am, there's nothing other than me, then I can't be lonely, no? So when, and, and in that state of aloneness, I can't have fear also, no? I fear when something separate from me. But if that is also me, I alone am, what can I be afraid of? Yeah? So, the lonely soul passions for the alone. The heart that loved man thrills to the love of God. A body is his chamber and his shrine. This body is the chamber and shrine of God. Beautiful Kabir Bhajan we were doing in our music class where he says, Tirat kaun kare? Hamaro tirat kaun kare? I'm not going to go on a pilgrimage. Man mohi asan, man mohi kadasan, man mohi ganga, the ganga, the asan, everything is inside me. Why should I go on any other outer pilgrimage? A body is his chamber and his shrine. Then is our being rescued from separateness. Then we don't feel lonely anymore. We are in that blissful state of Kevalya, aloneness. The body is his chamber and his shrine. Then is our being rescued from separateness. All is itself. All is new felt in God. So that is the Madhukand of Brihad Aryanka Upanishad. All is new felt in God. All is felt as honey. Remember we said as if every drop of honey could taste itself and taste every other drop of honey and taste the whole honeycomb. Sri Aurobindo says that is the end purpose of our yoga. So Tasting this honey is that experience of everything you felt in God, the intimacy of God everywhere. All is itself, all is new felt in God. A lover leaning from his cloister's door, cloister is like a church, a place of worship, gathers the whole world into his single breast. So it's like that God essence is like a lover leaning down from his cloister's door, gathers the whole world in his single breast. Then shall fail the then shall the business fail of night and death. Night and death is ignorance, our identification with our outer self. Then shall fail, then shall the business fail of night and death. When unity is one. When strife is lost 
and all is known and all is classed by love who would turn back to ignorance and pain yeah clear everything so i'll just read this whole passage again just feel it a mystic slow transfiguration works all our earth starts from mud and ends in sky and love that was once an animal's desire then a sweet madness in the rapturous heart an ardent comradeship in the happy mind becomes a wide spiritual yearning space but i want the mother more becomes a wide spiritual yearning space a lonely soul passions for the alone the heart that loved man thrills to the love of god the body is his chamber and his shrine then is a being rescued from separateness all is itself all is new felt in god a lover leaning from his cloister's door gathers the whole world in his single breast then shall the business fail of night and death when unity is won when strife is lost and all is known and all is clasped by love who would turn back to ignorance and pain any questions anything to share yeah No, you are aware of the, if you are feeling anxiety, you are conscious you are feeling anxiety. How can you be conscious two hours later? Sometimes you may be so overwhelmed by a certain emotion. But you know you are feeling it. You are overwhelmed. No, it's what I am asking. Sometimes. Is it? I have not experienced. I know I am feeling anger or anxiety. The fact that I can't do anything about it in the moment is a separate issue. But I know I am feeling it. you are overpowered by it yeah so then at that point of time you can't be present to it so that's what you become present to it instead of getting lost in the stories it's building uh, you know thiknath han said something very beautiful convert the fire of suffering into the light of consciousness convert the fire of suffering by the light of to the light of consciousness how do you do that you suffer when you are unconscious but if you become conscious you start paying attention to that emotion you start seeing dimensions to that mind state which somehow make you lighter what i'm saying is if don't get lost in the content of the story be hold that emotion in your hands like you're holding a baby you're a mother to that baby listen to that baby maybe the emotion will speak as a sensation somewhere in your body the anxiety may feel like something in your belly listen to that sensation listen to that emotion and somehow your own inner wisdom will then start you know in peaceful warrior when dan meets with an accident what did joy tell him she said i know you're going through a painful time are you paying attention normally when somebody is going through pain you will give platitudes whatever what does this wise girl tell him i know you're going through a very painful time are you paying attention or have you lost all your attention in the story of that whole moment so uh, no sorry it was ekhat toll who said convert the fire of suffering into light of consciousness thiknath han said that um, when you are on the path 
I'm not telling you don't suffer. You have a right to suffering. Pain is your privilege. But you have no right to not suffer consciously. If you are a seeker, you will suffer. But don't call yourself a seeker if you become unconscious when you suffer. Become very conscious when you suffer. The unconscious people will become even more unconscious when suffering comes and they'll suffer a lot. But the conscious person, it's a great opportunity to become even more conscious. And the need of the moment makes you conscious. Your survival instincts kick in. And you just become very alert, very conscious. And you start paying attention. Yeah, so they say suffering can make you better or bitter. If you become unconscious, it will make you bitter. But if you become conscious, it's a great chance to grow. Like that story of Radhanath Swami, I mean, you can't imagine that kind of suffering, but it only made him better. He came out of that night just with consciousness and gratitude. Yeah? Any other questions? Okay, so then let's sit quietly and let's summarize and take into life what we've done today. So we started by recapitulating our last Savitri class. We started by reminding ourselves of that beautiful mantra from Prashna Upanishad, which says that, Oh God, give me that kind of listening to the footfalls of life where I see only good only sacred in every footfall where I hear only good. Let me see the unfolding of life so that I see the good in everything that happens. But often my experience contradicts this. So we explored a story from the life of Radhanath Swami quoted in his autobiographical account, The Journey Home, where he had to spend a whole night with a mongoose sitting on top of his hair, the mongoose who had made a nest in his hair. And if he moved slightly and the sleeping mongoose awoke, he would get bitten. And the mongoose had brought all kinds of insects which were biting him. But he was helplessly waiting for the mongoose to finish its nightly sleep and move out of his head. And feeling very overwhelmed, at one point something shifted. Gratitude arose. He looked at the mongoose as God coming to teach him patience and forbearance. And the next few hours passed in this state of gratitude till the mongoose went away. When we are going through suffering, we always have the choice of tapping into our deeper wisdom and accessing the truth of mother's words if you take Everything that comes to you as grace, you will see that it is indeed grace. And this seeing of everything as grace comes easily if we see ourselves not as the Nam Rupun but as Brahma. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahma, the God essence that pervades everything. And to see everything also as Brahma, Sarvam Brahma. So it's myself everywhere, every exchange between me and another is an exchange of this honey of self with itself. 
the more I am identified with this deeper self, the more there is an experience of completion, tripti, wholeness. The more I'm identified with my surface self, my identity as an Aita, the more incomplete I am. And because deep down I know I am all bliss and all completion, I cannot be content with the experience of feeling incomplete. So I keep trying to fulfill desires, thinking that in doing so I will find completion. But trying to feel complete through fulfilling desires is drinking salt water to quench my thirst. The more I drink, the thirstier I get. When my identity with the deeper self is weak, many desires are there. The stronger that identity is, the less the desire. This is something beautiful we explored with my yoga teacher, Jangir Sir, in his workshop on the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. So, the deeper I go, the more quenched I am, the more fulfilled I am. When desire comes, there are two ways of dealing with it. One is to shift identity to the deeper self, where I feel so complete that I see that the object of desire cannot add anything to me, and so the desire goes away. Mother says it beautifully that there's much more joy in releasing a desire than in fulfilling it. Whenever I release a desire without my knowing it, my identity shifts to my deeper self or closer to it. And a taste of that self is a taste of joy far greater than the joy the desire fulfilled will bring me. The other way of fulfilling desire, again what my yoga teacher said, is to remove a thorn with a thorn. If there's an overwhelming desire for an object or a person, I remind myself that I want the mother more. That desire is the second thorn which removes the first thorn of desire. In this way, desire which can be the greatest weakness of the human mind can also become the mind's greatest strength. So, whenever I'm really desiring something, I can remind myself, oh, but I want silence more. I want the joy felt with identity with the self more. Or I want to love the mother and the feeling I get when I love her more. and offer the desire to this superseding desire. And desire is also misdirected aspiration. Deep down, I'm always aspiring for the truth of my deeper self. Because I don't know how to find it, I use the outlet of desire. But desire or love or want has various stages of evolution and we explored these beautiful lines from Savitri which trace the evolution of desire. All our earth starts from mud and ends in sky and love was once an animal's desire then a sweet madness in the rapturous heart, an ardent comradeship in the happy mind becomes a wide 
spiritual yearning space a lonely soul passions for the alone the heart that loved man thrills to the love of god a body is his chamber and his shrine so in our practice let's try and work with these two ways of dealing with desire shifting identity to the deeper self or desiring the other thing more letting the spiritual yearning supersede the material yearning just with that thought hands together in a namaste let's end with three ohms So people, there'll be no Savitri for the next three Saturdays. We'll meet in the new year, the second week of Jan. Okay?